sorry. Arav Tov, Kol HaKahal, Beit Yaakov, and thank you, Rabbi Tov, for your beautiful introduction. The year was 1942, and we lived in the city of Prussia. I was nine years old, my sister was four years old when the Germans marched in and began their work with the help of the Slovak Linka Guard. We had a lovely apartment and a very good street. We had to move out of there, wound up in a one little room. And all of us, and of course, immediately they started taking the men. Thank you. Immediately they started taking the men to Arbeitsland. So the men slowly started to hide themselves. This was about the same time now at Pesach. Some had come back to be at the Seder. Of course, they were caught by the Germans. My father did not come home, but we lived in this little apartment, and we were in the courtyard. And, all the, and my sister, my mother, and I, all of a sudden we hear people coming, running to tell us, the Germans are coming, the Slovaks are coming. So we try to hide, everybody is trying to hide, into their apartment. We remained in the yard, we did not have room, we didn't know where to go. There was a cellar door, cellar right next to, on the side, and we decided we'll go into the cellar, and we ran down the steps as we heard the big gate being opened. We pushed ourselves straight against the wall as much as possible, and my mother put her hand over my sister's mouth, I just didn't cough. And here we are looking and these people, these soldiers are going around and they stop at the edge of the cellar, we could see their boots. And one of them says, there must no one be here because the door is open. So that was our first miracle. After that, my father came home and we decided, he, he felt we are Hungarians, we are going to Hungary. So we wound up going to Michalovce, which was the closest to the border and where my mother had a sister living there. <coughs> we stayed there while my father was uh, uh, fi trying to find us someone to take us over the border. To take us over the border. Uh, finally he did, but that person would not take us children, just the adults. My mother, my parents went with them, we stayed with my aunt and uncle, and a few days later we get the uh, word that my parents crossed the border but were caught just across, once they crossed it. They were brought back and put in jail in Michalovce, and they were considered as, Jewish, as smugglers, so that was the, at least the sentence that they were given. And it was really kind of a lifesaver because by that time the transports were beginning to go. And my parents were put in jail for seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. We used to visit them sort of every day for an hour. That was the only communication we had. After they were released, my father said, we are going again, but we are not going without the children. So he found, luckily, a Jewish man who was from Ungar. We had actually been born in Ungar, all of us, and we felt very close to that city. And he agreed to take us, the whole family. So we started, we went to a village where uh, there was a close to the border, and then uh, we crossed, but walking through the uh, fields, in mud and whatever, and we made it across. My mother could hardly walk, she wanted to stay behind, but of course we wouldn't let her. My father carried my sister on her on his back. So we made it to uh, the outskirts of Ungwar called Sobrans, where my father's sister lived. Uh, these people, it was Shabbat. We walk in and they could not imagine, here we are coming in, what's happening, where are you coming from? Okay, anyway, they pulled down the shades, and my uncle immediately ran to find the family in the shul in the city to let us know we are here. 
So eventually a family came and we were um, made to live uh, in a, um, at, a, at, a, at the cemetery, at the Jewish caretaker uh, house, a hovel, not a house. He had about six children and we lived uh, among the straw and every time there was a, a Jewish funeral we had to hide, we couldn't be outside, otherwise we were playing between the quarry. And this lasted about four weeks. My parents had to be taken to uh, Debrecen, it was decided, because that was more of a city that people can get kind of lost in it. And since they were very well known in Umbar, they couldn't really remain in Umbar. My sister and I, we were uh, taken to my grandparents, my mother's family, who lived not far away from the city. And of course we were welcomed with open arms, with beautiful white uh, sheets, with fresh food, with delicious uh, halot bait for Shabbat and langosh, which is like a pita. It was wonderful to be among the, at the grandparents. And uh, also, they had a vineyard, so we were offering to help. So we got a little basket, and sure enough, uh, more grapes went into our mouth than in the bank basket. But that's how it went, because we got sick, and then we were sent home because we couldn't help. As we went on, the weather was lovely, it was summertime. We are in the backyard, and there's a big knocking on the door. So when you hear knocking like that on the door, and the situation you know what you are in, it doesn't go well. So sure enough, we opened, my aunt opened the door, and there stands three Hungarian gendarmes with their uh, uh, helmets, with the feathers, very fierce, very scary looking. My aunt was very boisterous and lovely, and she managed to get us out of the situation. I happen to resemble my mother very much, and many of the neighbors were kind of pointing fingers. They knew that maybe we moved to Slovakia, maybe we are the Slovak children. Luckily, it passed. Uh, I was told that I was white as a sheet, because uh, I, I just didn't know how to deal with the situation. Anyway, a few couple months down the road, uh, I was taken to also to join my parents in Debrecen, as I would have had to start school. And we lived at uh, this widow lady, had a uh, room, and my mother was very helpful to her. And, excuse me. <clears throat> we had been, we had some uh, distant relatives there, that place became like our headquarters. Many other Slovakian relatives happened to come in, and especially one, and that was mainly, we could find out anything from that area. We, uh, this cousin, cousin Julius, who was also from Slovakia, he had a lot of connections, and he was able to ascertain when we are going, when there's going to be a razia. Razia meant that the police went from door to door checking if there are illegal immigrants. He let us know and we were able to get out of the city a few times during that period. Luckily, we were, you know, when you have papers, no matter what kind of identification papers you have, it's only good until you look at it. If the policeman decides it's not good, you don't have much of a chance. So, we uh, continued living like that, and uh, again, what happens? Uh, March 19, 1944 comes along, and we are, uh, the Germans march in. It was a Sunday, a beautiful Sunday. So, the ghettos are being established in no time, and all kind of fears, all kind of edicts are being given around. Some Slovaks decided, Slovak Jews, decided to go back. Suddenly it was a little quieter in Slovakia, and so did my, our cousin Julius. But before he left, somehow my father told him, we are not going to go into the ghetto. And it was a bold decision in a sense. Uh, my, so our cousin Julius decided, had some uh, connection, and he gave us a paper with our names 
uh, my uh, father and mother and two daughters in Hungary, totally Christian names. We took those, uh, my mother took those papers, she had on this black coat with a yellow star and then she put a raincoat on and marched into the city hall requesting the copies of papers. So of course uh, the clerk looks at her and says, uh, uh, what do you need these papers for? How come you don't have these papers? So she says, we lost them, and as you well know, we cannot live without papers. Everybody is asking for identification. Fortunately, he gave it to her, and she marked out of there. We moved into another neighborhood altogether and started living as Christians. It was summertime, and this same cousin, Julius, happened to give us a key to another house. And the other house was in a very beautiful area. Debrecen has, uh, it's called a forest or Nagyarbe, and it's a very beautiful area. So we found out there was a lovely villa there. We went to that villa, we inspected it, and decided this is a good place to stay. We had, uh, there was uh, delicious chocolates in the cupboard, there was, uh, we found a radio, in the meantime, there were a lot of bombings uh, during, the, uh, during the summer. You know, the Allies were bombing Romania, the oil fields. It was not exactly a quiet lifetime. But we managed to go to this uh, villa and settled ourselves in there. Uh, middle of the summer, we get a knock on the door. Of course, again, when you hear no these knocks on the door, you become immediately worried. My mother opens the door and there stands this very good-looking Hungarian officer and he says to my mother, Who are you people? Why are you here? How come you live in my house? So my mother immediately said, Sir, sit down, make yourself comfortable, I'll make you an omelet, you are probably weary from your travels. And my father says to him, you know, we have another apartment and I have my papers uh, there because here we are only temporarily. So it worked. The man sat down for a little while, but suddenly he is getting a call from his unit, he has to return. Thank God he never returned. It was like another miracle for us. So here we are, another month down, almost the holidays, high holidays, big bombings. One, eve, one day we had to run down to the basement. Luckily we found a wooden tub, which we sat down on a bench, and this was, we held over our heads crying Shema Yisrael with the highest voices we could. Thank God we survived that. And we are out. A few days later, we see people passing by our street. Where are you going, people? What's happening? They have a blanket and they have a basket in their hands. Well, don't you know the Germans and the Russians are going to have a big fight about the city. Each one is fiercer than the other. They all want to hold on to it, and they are almost at the gates. We are going to this shelter from the university. Well, we couldn't tell them that we love, would love to see the Russians come in as soon as possible. We had to go along. We went into the shelter also taking some blankets and some food, and sat down in a corner like everybody else on the ground, and we had some food with us. We started to eat, and my father, being a religious man, never took his hat off from his head when he was eating. He kept his hat on. Later on, we heard rumblings. These people must be Jewish. He eats in a hat. Of course, the hat came off. And for a few days, for about 10 days or so, we, my, mother, my father had problems eating the food, so my mother and I used to rush out to the house, it was like a 20 minute walk, and see what we could cook. We had vegetables, there was a garden with vegetables. So we were able to provide a little soup along the way and bring it. The fighting was very fierce after a while, and of course the Russians 
walked in after about a two week battle, more than two weeks. We were very scared of the Russians because they were wild, but we were happy, at least maybe we will be free. Many of the Hungarians uh, left, went to their uh, homes. We did not have where to go. So my father, after a while, ventured out into the city, and the only man he encountered was a young man who had escaped from uh, uh, Lager from hiding. There was no one else. He came back and says, there was no one else in the city. It was an unfeeling, a terrible, eerie feeling. We had, uh, we had to move out of there, so we found an apartment in the center of the city, in the Jewish section. And we kind of became a Grand Central, Central Station because people started looking at us, whoever came back. A family, we took kids, uh, survived. They didn't know what, what to imagine. Slowly, slowly, actually, we were liberated October 19, 19, October 19, 1944. So we were liberated way before the rest of Hungary was liberated. Uh, early January or February, my father says, I'm going to Ungbar. I want to see where my family, I want to talk to my family. So he started down, of course, we tried to dissuade him, it didn't help. He got to the train station, and even though he had some papers, the Russians called it Bumashka, it didn't help because they, nobody there knew, knew how to read. They just took him and threw him in the wagon. Fortunately for us, somebody who knew him saw that this is what happened, so they came running to tell my mother. And what did my mother do the next day? She picked herself up, left us two children among all the people that were there in the house and left us there and she started to see how she can follow the train or find out where it went. Uh, she went to the train station and she was able to talk to, uh, to the Russians. She knew some Russians. She knew how to read and write a little bit. And luckily to her, for her, it was a Russian, uh, the Russian was a Jew. And he was so taken by her story that he helped her get on a very famous express train which went toward Romania, because assumedly this train went toward Ukraine, but through Romania. So my mother followed that. I went on that train. I don't know how many days it took, but she wound up in the city of Arad. And as she found, she went and seeked the Jewish community, and she found them. And on the list in the Jewish community, my father's name was on. So she, he managed to escape from the train just about before crossing into Romania or crossing to Russia, I'm not sure, but he managed to escape and he made his way back through that city. It took about, uh, about three weeks for each of them to kind of come back. That time it was not an easy matter to, co to come and go. And fortunately they both made it back. So again, we were a family. Then we took on another apartment and we stayed in Hungary another, another two years or so. Where we, my family and parents decided we're going to Palestine. We're not staying with the Russians for nothing. So we attached ourselves to a, a group, uh, Halutzim, and we signed up and we went with them, wounding up after many weeks of travel in Germany under the uh, American uh, zone uh, in a displaced persons camp in the city of Wetzlar, about two hours from Frankfurt. And there began a whole new saga of our lives. At first it was very, very difficult. We were uh, supported by the United Nations, by the 48 states of the United States, by the Joint Distribution Committee, but it was very difficult. We were in a small little room, six people with six pots, the showers, if there was any, there was at the end of the corridor, the toilets too. It was an awful living for quite a long time. But uh, many, many uh, Polish and other uh, Latvian, Lithuanian Jews came. Somehow the borders were open then. 
So as soon as possible, they established in our, there were, we had like 4,000 people in that uh, DP camp. But they established schools immediately for the young people. So we had, we had been in a, in a disciplined uh, place uh, getting uh, education. Education was the Ivrit language immediately and Zionism. We had many Shlithim who were able to get from Palestine to Germany and to other places in Europe who came to help us get across, uh, get to learn more about Palestine. It was uh, very, for me as a young girl, it was a good living because it was new, everything was new to me. I was free. We were all free. My parents had a harder time. My mother had, did not have an easy time to take care of us. But we, we, there, then we had you know, young people and they came uh, 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 soccer players and some musical. It was, it was a kind of a little, we had newspapers that were printed. In the end it turned out to be not such a bad living, but of course I don't wish it on anyone. And this went on for about three years. And we had, uh, we, we were somehow, some, some situation arose that we were not able to go to Palestine. So we switched to go to America, and we had to wait for our visa. Well, the camp, the American, uh, so the Americans decided to close the camp. And we had to move to another camp. So in 1949, beginning 1949, we had moved to this other camp, where being, to my luck, which was beshert, that I should meet my future husband there. And we managed to come to America within a few months of each other, but he moved to LA, Los Angeles because his family lived here, and we stayed in New York. But we got married in 1952, and then established ourselves here in Los Angeles. Hard work, my parents followed me, very hard work, learning the language, and just being free. This was, America was wonderful to us. We, we, we came with nothing, and here we are already establishing ourselves, uh, a, a factory, a house, Baruch Hashem, we were very blessed. And we, I'm very grateful, sadly, that my husband is not here to join me, Zephron Olev I have, Baruch Hashem, a beautiful family, ten grandchildren, six great-grandchildren, and three original children. And two of them live in Israel with their families, and one of us lives here. And now we are celebrating 70 years of beautiful Israel. It's, it's a wonderful miracle. Ani ma'amin be'muna shlema u'beviyat ha'moshiach. I'm just trying to hide.